<laughs> Topic tonight is when should I start it? And it seems, I think, like a, a simple question, and in many ways it is a simple question. And uh, as I've put together this talk, I realized um, the things that I thought I knew about this question and the things that I thought I wanted to talk about were actually not the things um, that ended up being what made the cut. So um, I'm pretty excited about it. Um, let's see here. So people often ask me, so what do you do? Which is a question I dread. Um, I bring people together and we solve complex problems. That's what we do. Okay. And that looks like a lot of different things, um, but that's the simplest, most coherent way I've found to answer that question. I'm kind of curious, uh, what do you do now? How do you know when, when should I start it? So uh, this will be a, a little bit of audience participation, just show of hands. Um, do you start, I start work when, um, so who starts work when somebody tells you, usually someone with authority says, you, it's time for you to start this thing. Is that, raise your hand if that's true for you. This is the, the uncomfortable audience participation part where people are like, eh. yeah, so it depends. It can mostly apply, all right. So not many, that's interesting. Uh, what about somebody stops by and says, hey, can you do me a solid? Does that apply to anybody here? Yeah, okay. What about um, somebody called, you, emailed me, texted me and said, hey, I need you to do this thing. Anyone? Okay, interesting. Um, what about this one? Uh, I don't really like what I should be doing, <laughs> so I'm going to start this other thing that I want to do more than the thing that I should be doing. Okay, yeah, we're human beings. Um, how many of you say, hmm, I actually have capacity. Like, I'm in slack time. Like, I don't have anything to do right now, so that would be a good time to start. Any of us have that? A couple? That's good, sometimes. It's happened once. It's happened once. <laughs> Um, or something else. So if, if you didn't raise your hand, like what, what else is a trigger for you to start work? When, when do you know you should start it? When the sprint is ending. When the sprint is ending. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I love MMG, but I will say at 8 o'clock, not 8.01. <laughs> That's when you start work. Oh. <laughs> this, is a, this is a company culture thing, huh? Culture. So but what about like a specific work item? Right, when do you start? Like what's your signal to, to start something? When I remember it, okay. If the customer needs something. If the customer needs something. For right. me, it's, a, it's as soon as I find out about it, because it's always too late. Yeah, right, somebody said, oh, well, that was yesterday. Right, should have started it yesterday. Okay. No, I'm gonna say when I can pull it. When you can pull it, good, good answer. <laughs> good answer, Sarah. All right, um, so yeah, this is a, this is a range of things um, for us, and and my hunch is that most of us, I'll, I'll own this especially, I often don't take a very disciplined approach to how I start things, right? And, and I think um, understanding that that is true is probably an important thing. And, and, and being honest about when should I start something or when should my team start something is probably a good uh, question for you to, to answer together. So I'm going to give you some answers to that. So what this talk isn't about, this is interesting for me at least, I thought this is what I was going to talk about when I put this talk together. I thought I was going to talk to you and with you about things like metrics and statistics to manage flow. And I thought we would be talking about things like flow efficiency, which is really important, but probably not so important in this format. I thought we might be talking about things like lead time scatter plots, also really important, but probably not so important here, unless I want to put you all to sleep, which you might because you had a nice, uh, if you were like me, a nice high gravity IPA out in the lobby. Um, and now we're going to look at charts. Um, there's an amazing thing called cost of delay. Really cool way to sequence work. <laughs> we're not going to talk about that. Um, optimal batch size. How do you trade off batch size uh, transition, transaction cost and holding cost? That's probably pretty important to know too. We won't be looking at cumulative flow diagrams. Aww. Aww. We won't be looking at lead time histograms. We won't be talking about lead times or cycle times. Uh, uh, we won't be talking about cost of delay divided by duration or weighted shortest job first. Wow. Both pretty important things. 
Um, let's see, what are some other things that I didn't put on there? There's, there's a bunch of other ones, right? Um, but this is not what we're going to talk about, which, yeah, sure, it's like, good, <laughs> right? So what are we going to talk about? Um, this idea, this really, really, really simple idea that understanding why you might start something is really important. And that this isn't so much about processes and tools and changing behavior, and it's more about understanding our mindset and what do we value, really, and what principles do, I, do we abide by, really. Because that's what it really, I think, comes down to. Anyone have uh, the sense that you have, I don't know, an excess amount of time at work? <laughs> <coughs> right? Usually, I've yet to find somewhere where people are like, yeah, we're just kind of hanging out, waiting. Um, it does happen every once in a while, but not usually in a very good context. Um, so we're constantly making these trade-offs and bets. And we're often, I don't think, very aware of what they are or why we're doing them, or what really is at stake. What are we really trading? And my, my uh, assertion is, if we bring some awareness to that, we can start making better ones. Okay, so I'm going to give you six ideas. And um, we'll start with this one. Just keep, keep the promises you make. So uh, one of, uh, and, I'll, and I'll be telling a lot of stories, mostly about uh, folks I've worked with. And um, there seems to be a, an, a common theme or an often theme with folks that they will tell a story kind of like, um, I know I was at work for eight or 10 hours. And when I think about what did I actually get done, it was like two hours worth of actual stuff. And that's every day. And I've just buried all the time. And I don't know what to do, and I don't know how to get ahead of it. And people are constantly asking me, when, is it gonna, when am I going to get this thing? And in my world, that's a promise that I'm making. If I say I'm going to get this thing done, I'm giving you my word, and my word is important. And so um, I think getting serious about um, our commitments and, and do we take that seriously or is that sort of like a, a nice to have so we can tell somebody we're, we, we're working on it, we started it, um, which honestly most people like to, that's what they want to do. It's easier to tell my boss, the execs or whatever, we're working on it than we're holding it off so that we can get other things done first. Um, so I would suggest that your, quite simply, your word matters. You should keep it. If you're going to give your word, keep it. And if you're going to give your word that you're going to get something done, don't start it unless you can finish it. And know that you can finish it. And that when you do that, people are often asking me, like, oh, how do you, what's a high-performing team look like? Well, in my mind, a high-performing team is one that fosters trust amongst itself and with the organization that it interacts with. And uh, oftentimes, product owners especially are like, how do I get stakeholders, how do I build trust with stakeholders? Well, it might start by just delivering the stuff you say you're going to deliver when you say you can deliver it would be a good place to start. That's often a novel concept. They're like, wait, what? Yeah, just do the thing you said you're going to do when you're going to do it, and you'll start building trust. They'll start actually trusting you, right? Um, there was a, uh, an in, a, a project program I was involved in a few years ago uh, as a result of a product owner training, and the product owner, uh, as often is the case, um, asked me a question like, hey, I've got like, depending on the day and how you count them, between 8 and 12 stakeholders. And I've got one scrum team. How do I work with that many stakeholders? Because they all want different things, and, and, and we can't please all of them all at once. And uh, so my, my answer to that is, well, I can help you with that. Get them into a room for a couple of days, and call me, and we'll do something. Okay, We'll figure it out. And I've given that uh, suggestion many, 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 many times. And this one product owner finally, her name's Kate, she finally said, OK. So she called me, and she said, they're going to be in Boston on like December 13th and 14th or something like this, right? And so um, these folks showed up. 
And they didn't really know what to expect. They were saying, do I need to kind of bring the heavy with me, right? Do I need to put on the armor and like get ready to get into the ring with these folks? Like what's gonna happen? And what we ended up doing, instead of kind of slugging it out together and, and fighting over who's more important, and we just had a conversation about identifying what do we want? What does success look like? Where's the system? The system was in shambles, by the way. It was uh, an application that paid out their independent sales force commission. So kind of important, people's money. Uh, it had been determined the year before, after the thing had been written, this is a great candidate to put in the cloud because we're going to cloud strategy. So they started, they moved half of it to the cloud and then leadership changed and budgets changed and, and it turns out that this th particular system actually needs to be in one place to function. And when you put half of it in one place and the other half of it in another place, it literally doesn't work. And so every time payday came around, the whole thing blew up and it just all hell broke loose. Right? So this is where these people are coming from, everyone from call center managers to independent uh, you know, agent representatives to IT folks, and trying to figure out what are we gonna do? Because right? we don't, it's, it's, not, it's simply not tenable. And so we figured out what is the promise we're gonna make together, and let's start building iteratively towards that. Um, Kate reported to me, she said, you know, it's really wild. Um, we have like 30 stakeholders come to every sprint review. And they know what's going on and they're informed and they ask really good questions and then they are willing to make the trade-off decisions together about what we're gonna do next. Right? It's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool, uh, different way to, uh, to proceed. Being able to keep your promises. Uh, there's an old Buddhist proverb, right? Um, the full cup cannot accept more tea. If you want to let something in and you're already like all the way at capacity, it's, there's just nowhere for it to go. So maybe you need to pour some of that tea out, make room for a new promise. So this is a little bit um, connected. I'll tell a couple of stories about this one. Um, that before you start something, it might be a good idea to know that you can finish it and when. So one of my, my major engagements right now is, is at State of Maine. There's a few, few of my awesome colleagues here. Um, and I'm, I'm back at State of Maine. Uh, I did a stint up there in 2015. And one of the things we were looking at doing in the spring of 2015 was uh, to rebuild a, a program that handles what they call their summer food program. So uh, my understanding, State of Maine has about 186,000 students. Yeah, so that the number, number's pretty good, says Kathy. Okay, so um, we have to feed those kids. That's a lot of meals every day. And so there's a lot of infrastructure and food warehouses and trucks and all kinds of stuff to provide all that food. Um, it turns out not all that food gets eaten in the school year, and there's always some amount of surplus left over at the end of the year. And that surplus needs to be gone by fall because more food's gonna come in. So we have a problem there. And we also have a problem that Maine is not a particularly wealthy state, especially people who have spent time up north know this. Uh, and so there's a bunch of kids who if they don't get food from school, they don't eat. That's just the reality. And so the stakeholders there, and we've got some programmers there, we're starting to do some story mapping. And the stakeholder says, um, if you can't get this system online by May 1st, those kids won't eat. That's kind of heavy. <laughs> kind of heavy for the team. And so uh, he just wanted an answer. Can we do it or can you not do it? Because if you can't do it, fine, just tell me. I just need to know, do I have to pay all these licensing fees again this year? Can I get out of them and do something else? And um, so we did a little story mapping, a little discovery work. And with Fistify voting, um, I asked the team, what's your confidence that you can get this thing done by May 1st? And they said, zero. <laughs> Across the board, we, we are not willing to take on that risk. We do not think we can get it done. And that guy was one of the happiest stakeholders in that moment I have ever seen. And he said, I need to buy you a beer. I just needed to know what to do. 
So sometimes this is, um, you know, there's all kinds of hurdles along the way, right? It's never like a clear, straight path from where we start to where we end. Um, there was another uh, effort up there with a different stakeholder. His name was Rick. Um, and Rick needed to be reporting accurate graduation rates to the Federal Department of Education. It turns out that there's funding attached to that. Yes? Federal government gives money to schools depending on how many kids they graduate. And so if they don't give good data, not quite that direct. Not quite that direct. Okay, all right. But if you underreport your numbers, you don't get the money you are entitled to, okay? It's good having uh, my honesty <laughs> check over here. Uh, so, so Rick, uh, Rick comes to me, and we've got a team, and it's, and it's uh, again, it's about May, June, and he says, um, I need, my, my federal reporting deadline is October 1, and if you can't make that deadline, if you can't provide this data for me by that deadline, I don't want to start. I would like to do something else with, with uh, this team and this team's efforts. I said, but Rick, like, we just spent a bunch of time, like, it seems really important. Yeah, it is really important. But you need it by October 1st, absolutely. And you're telling me that if we can't make it, we shouldn't start. Yes, then we shouldn't start. What do you mean? But I, need, I, I understand you need it. I also understand that you just told me what the trade-off is, that if, you, if we can't deliver to you on this date, then we shouldn't start. And I can't tell you that with any confidence that this team can make it. We just started. He didn't like that answer either. And so I said, hey, Rick, tell you what, let's make a deal. You buy a month, and we'll give you a better answer. It still might be no, but at least we'll have evidence behind that no. What do you think? He said, that sounds totally reasonable. Let's do it. Uh, and that team was actually able to get that thing done about a month early, which was pretty cool. Uh, but again, we didn't start until we were confident we would get it done. And sometimes, uh, so uh, when I uh, talk to folks, they're tr you know, on more of a, a business development kind of sales call, they're, they're like, well, so you're this agile coach. Yep. And you say, well, we've heard this thing about agile that um, you don't like dates. <laughs> that agile means we don't have to commit to dates anymore. So, well, uh, maybe. I don't think that's necessarily true. I say, you know, it's, time's different. Um, it's not that dates don't matter, but it's different. And so one, um, I was talking to head of a, a PMO down here in Portland, and he said, well, come on, like, we can't be unicorns. We can't be the only ones struggling with this stuff. So what, what, what do you see happening? I said, well, you want my honest, cynical answer? He said, yes. I said, here's what I honestly, cynically see, is that companies plan ahead, everything at the, f at the beginning of a project. They commit all their time, all their money. They throw everything in on this bet that they have no information about. And then they pretend to be surprised when they blow the budget and they blow the timeline and they can't deliver it and then they just keep extending it and when they finally reach some semblance of success, they celebrate like we, we did it. And that's just what I've seen I, and, and it doesn't seem like success to me, but whatever, right? And he said, yeah, that sounds pretty familiar. And I, from your responses, it seems pretty <laughs> familiar. Um, yeah, we're not, we're not very good at, at this. Um, so what are, what are some, some thoughts here? Um, maybe you ought to think it through a little bit first. Like we, it's not that you don't plan at all, it's that you plan smart. That didn't come out so intelligent, did it? Smartly. <laughs> it's that you do things like um, a little bit of discovery through something like story mapping, which we're doing right now up at State of Maine. Right, trying to figure out, is this an option that's worth the risk? Right? Buy a little bit of knowledge with something like story mapping or some other discovery process to figure out what are we actually talking about? What, what, are, yeah, what, are, what is our actual goal? Um, a lot of people don't know. But a lot of people also will agree. I say, hey, when do you know? This is not a trick question. When do you know the most? When you start or when you finish something? When you finish. And yet, when do we over and over and over again make all of the decisions and all of the commitments about how big it is, how much is it going to cost, when is it going to be done, how many people we need? We lock all that in at the very beginning when we know the absolute least 
and we know we know the absolute least, and we still do it anyway. And then we wonder, why does it keep going sideways on us? And we have no mechanism to check and ask as we learn more and course correct without, why didn't you know that? Well, maybe because you couldn't, but we do now, so shouldn't we make a better decision when we know more? Um, that sinking feeling of 2020 hindsight, wouldn't that be nice to, to get away from? Um, so yeah, a good, good wise proverb there, don't eat an elephant all at once, right? Break it apart. Check it out. Inspect and adapt. Work in smaller iterations. Make smaller commitments, smaller bets. Learn smaller things. Make smaller errors. Small is good. Small, small will protect you, and it will get you to that finish line, um, even if that finish line continues to move around on you and those hurdles continue to pop up and, and fall down. When it's safe to proceed, Safety is an interesting concept. Um, if you're familiar, there's a, uh, a movement right now called Modern Agile. Anyone heard of Modern Agile? <coughs> it's worth looking up. It's kind of a reimagining of the original Agile Manifesto, but based on what we've learned in the last, Jesus, almost 20 years. And there's a, one of the formative ideas came, comes from a, a body of knowledge called resilience engineering, which is the study of how do you maintain safety in complex systems. And resilience engineering is, uh, has come out of the aviation industry, studying w what, what creates bad things in aviation. Um, it's usually not what you think. It's usually not planes breaking. It's usually not pilots making bad decisions. It's usually combinations of things like um, poor management policies and um, lots of small erroneous decisions that on their own don't really cause problems but when you put them together they cause really big problems and if you look at um, our friends over at Boeing they're at what we call the sharp end of that <laughs> with the 737 max it's bad and getting worse um, and uh, at some point, I might give an entire talk just on that particular <laughs> aircraft because the, I mentioned that at, at a talk I gave down in Boston, and, and one of the people in the audience is like, hey, how much do you actually know about that airplane? I said, like, honestly, not, not much, but um, if you do, I'd love to talk to you after. And so he came up and he gave me like this sort of blow-by-blow -blow timeline from the 60s on up to the present day of the 737 and how it got to where it is, and it was incredibly fascinating. But here's the TLDR on that that in resilience engineering, um, bad, what they find is bad things happen when you only allow the force of efficiency and productivity and profitability to be the, the driver of your business or your organization. And if that is what drives your organization, it is only a matter of time before that sows a series of small events that will combine and blow up in big, unpredictable, catastrophic ways. That's what happened with the Challenger. Yep. NASA had, yeah, NASA learned that as well. Twice. Uh-huh. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> yeah. In many ways. And, and this is, um, these kinds of trade-offs are just constantly being made. In every place I've ever worked. I don't know about you all. But things like quality especially, we're like, uh, we got to get it out the door. That's the language of efficiency and, and profitability, pushing your organization into a risky place. Building things you cannot or don't know how to maintain, or the cost of which is going to be prohibitive, but you defer it because you're like, but it's not next year yet. Today it's still cheaper to shove it out. And so we shove it out and kind of cross our fingers that it doesn't blow up in our face in two years or whenever that thing has to be uh, rebuilt. Telling the truth is insanely important. One aspect of safety is psychological safety. We're not just talking about physical safety. Can people in your organization who know things bring that information to where it needs to be without any fear? And that might be to a teammate and that might be to a top executive. Elon Musk has a really interesting rule at Tesla, like anybody can talk to anybody and you should. You should come talk to me. If you think you have an idea and I need to know it, then you should tell me. 
most places, telling the truth is actually really difficult. And uh, one of my, uh, I wouldn't say go so far as to say it's a hobby, but it's certainly something that I find interesting, is to eavesdrop on conversations of people who don't think they're being listened to <laughs> around organizational truth. And usually it happens around, uh, I don't know, if you can find people in bars um, or bathrooms is a really good place. <laughs> Like, just go lock yourself in a stall in a bathroom for a couple hours, and you will learn so much about what is actually happening at that organization. And, like, what are the stories that people are truly telling about what is truly important there that they would never say if they thought somebody was actually listening? Right? It's, it's a really powerful thing, right? Um, safety extends to our stakeholders, to their money that they're using to pay us to the reputation that they have in the marketplace, to the customers that they serve, to their customers' information, if you have customer data. Maintaining safety of that is important. And, and, and one of the things I, I think about when I look at this list is like, wow, that doesn't, that's expensive. That seems like it would take time. It would, it is. It is a direct opposition to that force of efficiency and profitability. And yet, if we don't invest in these things and, and acknowledge that they're important, um, we're entering realms of risk that we may or may not actually want to be in. Okay, so I said uh, in my intro, I showed you this picture of me riding my mountain bike, and I've got a full face helmet on. What you can't see is the full suit of body armor I have underneath all those crazy baggy clothes, because we actually, as downhill mountain bikers, we don't like the Lycra. We like baggy because it looks cooler, and it's really just a fashion thing. Uh, but uh, one of the things that it enables us to do is um, crash in ways that without that stuff would be prohibitive, like hospital trips. I've broken, I'm on my fourth, I have a back plate that protects my spine, I'm on my fourth one. Because um, I keep breaking them, I keep crashing hard enough that they sh it shatters the back plate. And I get up and it's like, oh, that sucked. Get back on the bike and, and keep riding. Um, I've cracked a couple of helmets. Um, the knee pads, all the, you know, the other stuff's pretty good. But the idea being um, that when you have protection, whatever that means in your context, it enables you to navigate things that are otherwise prohibitive to do. And protection, like in a scrum team, is do you have working agreements? Do you know what you're relying on from each other for? Are you doing things like measuring your flow? Do you understand what, on average, an item, how long it takes to move through your system so that you know when to start something? Right? We just, I, one of the teams I work with right now, um, they had their, one of their top senior guys. He's a human being, yeah? He did this thing. It's called vacation. Imagine that, right? So he went on vacation, and, and, and he got a, a couple of things that were really important almost done before he left. And the thing that he didn't get done before he left was the documentation. And so they sat, and he was the only one that could write it, because he was the only one that knew how to document it. And so they sat in, uh, like, like, in production but not done state for the couple of weeks that he was gone. And then he comes back, and it's like, all right, now you got to write the documentations. And, and it's like, maybe you shouldn't have started those things. Or maybe they should have started them differently. Okay. Some other thoughts about safety. Um, if, you're, if you're thinking through, so one of the things I think through on my mountain bike is if this goes bad, like if I'm thinking, should I ride this trail? Should I ride this jump? Should I hit this feature? I think to myself, if it goes wrong, will I regret it? If this ends my season, if this sends me to the hospital, will I regret it? And if the answer is anything other than a resounding no, I don't do it. So uh, Annie Duke, who's an amazing author, she has a great book called uh, Thinking in Bets. She says, invite your future self into the room and ask your future self, will you be happy with this thing if it completely goes sideways on you between now and then? And if the answer is no, will you wonder why you took that bet? Don't take that bet. Go do something else. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. I won't let my front go. Right? 
It's funny, uh, so my son and I do ride bikes like that together, and it used to be, for before he started riding, it was like this kind of selfish thing, and now he does ride, and um, my wife says things now like, hey, why don't you and Liam go to Highland, which is a big mountain bike park in New Hampshire, why don't you guys go to Highland for the weekend? Mm -hmm. like, okay, <laughs> I can do that. All right, so um, it's worth it. So uh, worth it is interesting because a lot of, certainly product organizations look at this in my experience from what is the outcome or output that we're going to get we put this into it what's going to come out the other end and the thing that they don't i think spend enough time on is what are the all the things that we're not going to be able to do because we've chosen to do this thing what is the opportunity cost and those are probably multiple as a result of this commitment that we're making to do this one thing and do we have, we have we put any real thought into that or any real awareness or sense making into that? I think you should only do things that are worth doing. And that can be a hard thing to determine. Any product owners in the room? I know Kathy's one. Got a few of you. Right? This is a hard thing to figure out sometimes, yeah? In my other life, I'm a certified product owner. Yeah. Um, can be, it can be tough to figure out, but it's worth figuring out. Uh, Drucker at one point said, there's nothing quite so wasteful as doing perfectly that which should not have been done at all. <laughs> right? And there's a lot of that going on, I think. A lot of things being built, a lot of features and software being created because it was on the backlog, because someone thought it was a good idea. And when you scratch below the surface a little bit, like, why? Because uh, it was someone's thought it would be cool. That's great. <laughs> Are you willing to make a bet with real dollars on cool? Maybe, maybe not. They might want it. They might want it, right? Um, if you bring this into the personal level, there was a, a beautiful study done a few years ago. I can't remember by whom or the context, but it was to go around and talk to people on their deathbed and say, what, what do you, what, what, how is it to be on your deathbed? What are you thinking about? What do you regret, right? Seriously, what do you appreciate about your life now that you're, you know you're at the end of it? What do you appreciate about your life and what do you wish you had done differently? And none of them, not a single one said, I wish I spent more time at work. <laughs> not a single one. Yeah, Major. Uh huh. But we don't know until it's out there. So how, yep. how can we say that it's worth it without trying something? You have to, right? So uh, if if you put a technical spin on it, um, you can say if you are in operating in an ordered context where you can predict the future, you should do something like predictive process control. Okay. If you're in a complex or unordered system where you can't predict the future and you already know it, you need to go to empirical process control, which is trial and error. If you're going to go to empirical process control and you're going to do trial and error, you might want to bet on small things, not big things. So Taleb in Antifragile says uh, for a thought experiment, something along the lines of, if you need to have 10 kilograms of stone dropped on your head, you can choose to have it dropped all at once in one big rock, or you can choose to have it dropped as uh, a stream of sand. Which would you like? <laughs> <laughs> you might want to structure the bets you're making from a product development perspective so they're more like the sand and less like the big rock. Those, those little things you can learn from them and they're safe to learn from. They're productive to learn from and you buy knowledge that's helpful for you. It's not helpful to buy at the end of your project when you're out of money and out of time and, and you can't get those things back that we built the wrong thing. It's not about trying not to do the stuff you shouldn't do. It's about trying to do the stuff you shouldn't do fast. Right? <laughs> Is that true? Fail fast. Yes. Learn, learn or fail, whichever vernacular you would like to use. Um, another way to think about this, um, this is from Jeff Bezos of uh, the founder and CEO of Amazon, he said uh, very simply, some, there's two kinds of doors. There's one-way doors and there's two-way doors. 
There's two kinds of decisions. There's one-way decisions and there's two-way decisions. If you make the decision and you learn something and you want to undo it and you can, that's good. Know what kind of decision you're making. Is this something that there's an undo key for? And you can say, uh, we, don't, we don't like what we just learned. Let's back it out. And again, most places that I've worked with, they don't know how to do that even if they want to. So it might be good for you to knowing it's worth it and understanding the trade-offs to know, um, can you get it back? Can you come back through that door if what's on the other side is something you actually, turns out you don't want? Another reason to start something is it brings you closer to a goal. And in my experience, goals are, achieving goals is kind of a combination of things we like to do and things we were not so wild about doing. Like getting up early and doing yoga or gym or fill in the blank, yeah? Anyone made resolutions? <laughs> it's about that time of year, isn't it? They work? No, we still do them? Yeah. Huh. Um, so if you're going to say uh, we're going to do things that bring us closer to achieving a goal, we might uh, need to have determined what our goals are. And we might need to articulate what our goals are. Yeah, I am a purist in this way. <laughs> and it might be a, a, a low-level goal. Um, I used to, one of, a, a coach I worked with, I, I would ask teams, what's your purpose? And he's like, you got to stop asking him. That totally freaks him out. <laughs> okay. So um, there's kind of a range, right? So like if we, if we think of, uh, from a, a biological perspective, uh, my goal when I get up every day is not to breathe. And yet if I stop breathing or I lose oxygen, I'm not going to be able to do a whole heck of a lot pretty quick. Right? So like oxygen and sort of that, that just basic survival, that's, that's a valid goal to meet <laughs> on a daily basis. And if you're a business, um, your version of oxygen is probably money. Yeah, like without it, it makes it pretty hard to do things like turn on the lights, make payroll, pay cloud hosting bills, buy laptops, et cetera, et cetera. So when we run out of money, uh, we run out of uh, the ability to survive pretty quick. So the very bottom level, like a, a, a solid goal, if you don't know where to start, is like revenue. Like let's just peg some, make sure we're, we're protecting that. That's safety, yeah? And it can go on up to very aspirational goals um, like meaningfully protecting the planet or being socially responsible or whatever those things are. You know, and if you look at some of these top performing companies, um, they're really clear about their purpose and about why they exist. One of my uh, professors at grad school, Dave Cooperwriter, who uh, invented Appreciative Inquiry with some colleagues, he said uh, recently that purpose-driven organizations are something like a thousand percent more profitable than those who are not. And I don't know like where he got his data, and I don't know how accurate that data is, but I can agree that if, you, if everybody in your organization is aligned and on fire about why they're there, they're probably going to move some pretty serious stuff. And that's a function of leadership. Right? Why do we exist? Why are we here? Who are we together? Uh, I got a, a, a high school friend of mine who's now a professor, a full professor of illustration at a private college out in California. And he knew he wanted to be a professional artist and um, make a, a career as an artist. And, um, and so when he was done with high school, his, uh, he was able to work with an art tutor. And his art coach basically set up just some blocks, like by a window in his house and said, draw these every day, and you'll know when you can stop. And he's like, I drew those damn blocks every day, multiple times, for weeks. And then finally, I did it right. I finally was able to draw them the way that I wanted to draw them. Right? He understood his purpose, and he was willing to do the, that hard work, that daily grind of stuff that we just got to do. You got to put in the work to achieve those goals. Another story on that, there's a professional snowboarder named Jake Blauvelt who's not really a competitive snowboarder in that he goes to competitions and competes, but he's still very successful 
um, he, he lands uh, spots in snowboarding movies on like the really big, steep stuff like in Alaska. The stuff that you watch people, I watch people ride that and it's like, how do you do that and not die every single time? And um, that's what he does for his, that's his job. And he talks about uh, the pivotal moment when he stopped becoming uh, a hobby, an amateur snowboarding, became a professional snowboarder. He achieved the goal of that professional snowboarder. He spent a winter by himself up in a cabin, this little no running water, no electricity cabin up in northern British Columbia. And he snowboarded every day by himself in the backcountry. And he said, I hated it. It was awful. It was lonely. It was isolated. I didn't even like snowboarding anymore. But I did it. I went out every single day. And that was the process that he needed to do to, to achieve that goal. Right? How easy is change? <laughs> right? I mean, really, how easy is change? It's not easy at all. It's really difficult. And so if we don't understand why we're doing it and we don't have something to pull us through, as Covey called a bigger yes, it's maybe we won't make it. So it might be a, a wise thing if we're trying to figure out, should we start this thing? I don't know. Should we? What's our goal? Is this thing going to get us closer to it, regardless of if it's awesome or not? And the last idea, this comes from our, our uh, I don't know if we'll call him our friend. <laughs> um, certainly a very influential individual, Steve Jobs. Mm -hmm. I say I don't know if I'd call him our friend because I have friends who worked with him directly and they said he wasn't so awesome to work with. Uh, but he did certainly change the world. Um, he certainly did put a, a dent in the universe. That says ye old universe denter and that's ye old universe if you can't <laughs> read the, the art. Um, but yeah, sometimes um, doing something for the greater good just is, is, it makes it worth it. It just outweighs some of these other smaller ideas. And the most important things tend to do that. And sometimes those, those big dents start, um, I think often, if not always, they start as small dents. Lots of little small things combining together. Yeah. Snowballs rolling downhill, building up speed and size. Uh, there's a, uh, a, a, I believe, a, a pretty phenomenal young woman in the world right now, Greta Thunberg, right, who started an entire global movement sitting by herself with a sign saying, school strike for climate in Sweden. She never intended to become what she is. She never intended to kick off a global movement. But she did want to do something different. And she was pretty clear she wasn't willing to just kind of sit by. And so she started something, having no idea what would happen. I've certainly not done something that big. I, I did when I was in high school. Um, anyone, uh, when you're in high school, is choir a cool thing? <laughs> <laughs> so I was a full-on hardcore choir geek in, in high school. And we had, um, our choral director was sort of this mad scientist composer mad genius who did things that would probably not pass muster uh, today <laughs> as far as um, treating kids um, to, to uh, emotionally and mentally to get the kind of performance she did. Um, but we, would, we, we were good. We were really good. And we would get letters after our concerts about the impact that we had on people and, and the healing that hearing that music would give people. And, and I could never really understand that as a teenager when I was in the group. Um, what I did understand when I was a teenager in the group was the immense amount of work that it took to do that. And that all of us, if you were in that elite ensemble of 28 students, you spent probably 25 hours a week singing and making music. And you gave up your lunch hour on one day a week, at least once, sometimes twice. Um, you came in after school to practice. Um, I took summer school. I did night school. I took 7 o'clock classes. I did all stuff just so I could sing. Um, because it, it turns out it did make an impact. And sometimes if you just need to be lifted up, just go to a choir concert. <laughs> blow your mind. 
Um, so yeah, if, if, if you're wondering, should I start this thing? And you have the, the passion and the, and the real conviction that if you do it, you might just be able to put a dent in the universe. That might be a really good reason to start it. And I think it's not really possible to know. Right? If it will or not. So to recap, should I start it? I don't know. Can you keep the promise you're going to make? If you can, it becomes a, a good candidate. Should I start it? I don't know. Can you finish it? <coughs> and when? Do you have the time? Do you have the money? Do you have the, the people? Do you have the, what I would call resources? The tools? The environment? The laptops? Whatever those things are? Is it safe to proceed? How are you checking for that safety? How are you going to maintain that safety? Know your trade-offs. What are you betting for? What are you betting against? What are you not going to do as a result? What are you going to uh, lose as a one-way door when you say yes? That money and time, you can't get that back. You know that? Do your stakeholders know that? Do the people who really this decision rolls up to know that? Can you tell them the truth if they don't know that? <laughs> Which is another whole question. Uh, should you start it? Do you have goals that are actual real goals that you want to work towards? If you don't know what you're trying to accomplish, maybe that's the thing to figure out instead of just doing more busy work. And that can be hard too. And sometimes a shot at something really big, it just overrules everything. Anyone ever like just sort of made a big life decision on a whim and you just didn't quite know it would turn out and you did it anyway? You just kind of take that bet and, and jump. Yeah, sometimes you just got to go. So my sense is if we answer uh, any or many or all of these questions, you'll have a pretty darn good answer to should I start this thing or should I not start this thing. And if you want to get into really granular details like actually managing the flow of your work flows or your work states or whatnot, that's probably pretty important too. I don't think it's as important as these. And this is the thing that surprised me when I put this talk together, that these things were hiding underneath um, all of those statistics, metrics, voodoo stuff that um, I geek out on. But it's actually not the most important thing. So that's what I've got. Um, we've got a few more minutes for questions or comments. So open up the floor. What do you think? Questions, comments, thoughts? Tim? So I, I like your point about buying the month. Um, yep. To, to figure out if you can make that promise. You know, in a smaller concept, the, the idea of a research spike. Yep. You know what that next amount of work is. Is it a, is it a tool that you use? Yeah. So if you don't, uh, I'm just going to repeat it because I'm wearing a mic and Tim's not. Um, so if you... Um, if you, you can shrink that idea of buying a month to smaller scales through something like a technical spike, right? Where, where the idea is to buy knowledge, not buy a, an actual output, right? And that's critical. If you're in high complexity, knowledge is really, really valuable. And the, the other thing is, you know, you were talking about doing things in small increments. Yep. Uh, one thing that friend Jerry, Jerry Sanderson said to me a long time ago was, it's okay to fail, just fail fast. Yeah, fail fast. Uh, Taleb says those errors um, should be beneficial. And if the errors that you're making are, are harmful, they're probably too big. Shrink them. Shrink them down to a grain of sand if you have to. Right. What other uh, questions might you have? Yeah, Joe. I like these ideas of knowing when to start, but I wonder if um, would the same concepts apply if you've already started something? 
<laughs> when to stop. Uh, so yeah, so uh, when to stop. Um, uh, well, I, it, yeah, probably, right? To, to say, uh, when we started this, here's what we thought was true. Um, are those things actually true to the best of our knowledge right now based on what we've learned? Um, you know, a lot of people think uh, uh, there's another Agile Uprising podcast for, with Troy where he has an actual scientist uh, join him. And because a lot of us are talking about empiricism and using the scientific method. So he said, you know, we're always bandying this about. Maybe we should actually have someone who knows something about this, really? And so he has this kind of um, curmudgeon scientist, research scientist join. And this guy says, you know, the scientific method is not about proving your hypothesis. It's about disproving your hypothesis. And that's a critical distinction that most people uh, miss. That hypotheses exist to be poked holes in, not to be confirmed. Um, if you're just trying to confirm something, you've just opened yourself up to cognitive biases like confirmation bias. And all you're going to you look at a data set and go, oh, well, obviously my point is valid because you've just ignored all the things that disprove your point. Right? So instead, um, that's part of truth telling. Like uh, the military has what they call red teams. Red team's job is to find all of the problems in that assertion, right? If, we're gonna, if you're going to go do this mission, what are all the ways that it could go wrong? Maybe we should think about that before we send people into harm's way through very large one-way doors. That's a really good book, Red Team. Is it? I haven't read it. Mm, nice. It's all about so that's, that's one way, uh, one thought. Um, another thought is that sunk cost is a really bad decision-making mechanism to continue. Mm -hmm. If we stop, if, or if we don't stop, you know, what's it, what's it going to look like? Yeah. Um, could we do a little bit more? And it's done still what it, we thought it was going to be when we started. Right, again, like having, um, making that leap from predictive process control to empirical process control, that's not like a little thing you do. It's like a paradigm shift. And if you realize you're in a context where you thought you could predict the future and it turns out now that you're there, you can't, it's not too late to switch over and be like, let's start gathering evidence right now that will either invalidate or validate where we believed we would be. And if we're not where we think, if, we, if we're like somewhere off in left field, it might be a good idea to tell the truth. Like, dude, we're in left field. And if we don't change, we're going to run out of money and we're going to run out of time and we're going to miss the market window and our customers are going to leave or our competitors are going to catch up or whatever that thing is, um, those things happen. And they happen these days blindingly fast. Like terrifyingly fast for those. Anyone been in a company that got disrupted by a startup? No one here? Really? Seriously? Yeah, Joe, yeah. How fast did it happen, right? Like, I mean, it's like blindingly fast. Like you cannot believe how fast a, a, an amazing profitable business model just falls apart into nothing and you're like left trying to build a little straw house out of twigs like days to weeks to months it's nuts i'm old enough that i was disrupt we were disrupted by the internet yeah right <laughs> the what kind of like yeah web sales really uh i was at a company in, in san francisco in the 90s where the, we just misused the opportunity that uh, the, the web provided yep so oh you weren't alone in San Francisco in the 90s. Oh, yeah. it, was <laughs> it was a good time. <laughs> oh, God. But I really like a lot of what you brought up um, because I'm, I'm always a fan of uh, talking about what's underneath or what nobody's really talking about. Like, why is it hard to tell the truth? Mm -hmm. Why are people not willing to listen to these hard uh, yeah. kind of conversations or data points or, or whatnot? Uh, I, I am super interested in your flow charts. Oh, yeah, that's so cool. <laughs> Um, but this was really great. Uh, Good. Angle to come, to come nice. Out. So thank you. Yeah. Um, I just did a. a um, I'm operating part time as a scrum master right now, and, and I facilitated one of the first retrospectives that I've done in quite some time uh, yesterday. And the, one of the first things we did was create working agreements because that's you know I think you got to kind of put some boundaries around what are we doing here. And um, 
in the past I would have said, so this is getting at, you're getting at things underneath, by the way. Um, in the past I would have said something like, hey, we should probably have working agreements. Like what, how do you guys want to be in this space for this conversation, right? And we would have said some, a bunch of things that we feel we should or ought to say, like, oh, we should listen to each other and you shouldn't interrupt each other and we should be respectful of each other, right? Which are all very nice things. Um, and then you watch the retrospective happen and people are talking over each other and they're like on their phones and they're totally disengaged or whatever. And so I was like, what's a better question I can ask? And so I, I uh, said, look, the purpose of this conversation is uh, truth telling. The purpose of this conversation is to create the space to have the hard conversation to, to talk about the elephant in the room, not around it. And too often in software teams and in business, we talk around things instead of hitting the actual thing, like the, have the conversation that we really, really need to have in that moment. And everyone kind of went, wow, I, yeah, I could see how that's true. And I said, all right, so, you know, we're all grown-ups here. What's worked in the past? What, what has enabled you in the past to have the conversation where you talk about the elephant with the people in the room? Because that's what we need to be able to do. And they gave me a pretty profound list of things. And they then cor very courageously had those conversations together. And it, like, blew my mind. Right. Psychological safety. Mm -hmm. Well, so yes, and psychological safety is trust, and trust is a verb. It's not a noun. It's a thing we do. It's a process. It's a choice we make moment to moment with the people we're with. Do I tell this person the truth, or do I not tell this, or am I afraid? And I think uh, my invitation as a change agent is to foster the kinds of building the kinds of containers so people can tell the truth within them. Awesome. And, I, and I think that it's just that, right? It's not like waiting for someone else to do it. It's how do we do it ourselves and for each other. And sometimes it's as simple as like sitting someone down and being like, hey, I have something hard to tell you and I don't really know how to tell you and I don't know how you're going to take it. Um, is it okay if we have that conversation mm -hmm. even though it gets messy? Or same thing to a team. I have something to tell this you all, and I, and I don't know how to say it, and I don't have the very good language, and it's probably going to come out all wrong, and it might make a big mess, um, but can we do that together right now? That's what psychological safety actually looks like, right? That's what leadership looks like. Right? Yeah. Because if you want to be in those spaces, somebody, and it doesn't have to be like a manager or whatever, somebody has to be the, have the leadership skills or willingness or whatever to be vulnerable. Yes, courageous. absolutely. And to, to model that behavior in order to invite everybody else to do it. it yeah. Just yeah. So, so as part of this retrospective, so we did a, a, a core protocols check-in, um, which Richard Kasparowski introduced last meeting, for those of you that were there. So here are the things I'm mad, something I'm mad about, sad about, glad about, or afraid of. Or I pass, right? Those are your kind of two options. And so as I led, and... And the thing that I was sad about, which is the wildlife situation in Australia as a result of these fires, 500 million animals have died in Australia with these fires. And I was like, I get all choked up about it. Um, that's a vulnerable act, showing that emotion at work. Like a lot of people are like, I never cry at work. I'm like, really? Why not? <laughs> no right, software. like it's not that you should like be <laughs> sobbing uncontrollably and like <coughs> on the floor. Um, but we're human beings, right? Like we have emotions and sometimes those emotions are incredibly powerful and strong. And if you just bottle them up, you're not there anyway. So find some people who you can at least tell the truth with, right? All right, so we're out of time. Um, again, if you want a copy of these slides, I'll, send, I'll post this up uh, immediately. Um, there are some things you can do to learn more. When Will It Be Done by Dan Vicanti. Dan Vicanti is a statistician who is one of the creators of the Kanban method. He has lots to say about flow metrics and how to use them. Um, he has another a wonderful book called Actionable Agile Metrics. Making Work Visible by Dominica de Grandis. She's another early pioneer of the Kanban method. Um, brilliant book that's, again, very simple. She has a really fun way of, of presenting those ideas. One of my favorites continues to be the original high, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People from good old Stephen Covey. It was brilliant in the 80s, and it's still brilliant. It's held the test of time. 
the habits are still relevant because we're still human beings. Um, if you would like to learn uh, more about what I do in the, in the uh, kind of public classes, uh, this year I will be offering a two-day kind of Foundations of Agility class. Um, my intent is to have that be a certifying class through IC Agile. Uh, I will be offering a Foundations of Resonant Coaching. So if you're curious what does professional coaching look like and how do we become better coaches, that'll be a two-day introductory class there. Uh, I have a thing that we started last year called the Scrum Academy. Yeah, Roberto says. Um, I'm going to play with the format. Last year we had uh, six half-day sessions. I'm going to see um, what happens if we do two-day session, just a big concentrated thing. See what happens with that. Maybe do some of the, the more um, pathway versions. I've also got a product owner track on that, which is, I think, pretty rad. Um, and a two-day leading and complexity class, which is uh, more for leaders uh, to help leaders who are facing high degrees of complexity make sense of it and stay uh, centered. It's not called leading through complexity. You don't get to the other side of it. It's called leading in complexity because you're in it and you're going to be in it. There's a QR code that will take you to my uh, events page. I don't have dates on these yet, but I will shortly. And if you get a copy of the slides, you'll get the uh, QR code as well. Or I can leave this up if that's helpful. Because that's the last slide. So thank you very much. Thank you especially to, to our sponsors. Thank you for providing the awesome social hour, Kepler. That was really spectacular. Nice, long social hour with beer and grown-up stuff. Rad. So thank you all so much, and we'll uh, see you around.